Journey Smollett Bell, you've got one of the greatest jobs in Hollywood right now. You've got a show that is critically beloved. It's being watched by more than a million people a week. And it matters. This isn't just any slave drama, is it, underground? No, you know, it's, it's really special. It's so unique. And it's interesting because we were almost, you know, coming into this before we started to air, a lot of us felt like we were the underdogs, you know, because, you know, the feedback we were getting from people, a lot of people were very skeptical. Um, and we were getting a lot of comments like, oh, but why do we need a new slave drama? Like, convince me right now. Why do we need mm -hmm. a new slave drama? And, um, you know, a, a lot of people just were like, oh, well, Hollywood always likes telling these stories. Why these? And for us, you know, we, we, we were involved in this very incredible story together. And so we knew that it was different. Didn't know that people would respond this well to it. I mean, it's just like blown our minds just to see how it's almost been as if people feel like, where has this been all along? <laughs> well, now that we've seen the proper way uh, as fans of the show, and I think I became a certain fan of the show by episode two or three. And once we saw how this could be done properly, that was the first thought that we all had was, why, why isn't everybody doing this? Why aren't you focusing on the escape? In other words, when you do a slave drama, why do we always have to be at the plantation? Why do we always have to focus on the violence? Yes, that's part of life, but why not focus on the hope? Why not hope, focus on uh, the, the people striving for a better life? And then if you're going to do that, why not give some... Mark Twain had a great definition of what art is. He said it's a new perspective on ordinary things. That's, you know, in one sentence, that's pretty great. So what do you guys do? You give us uh, modern music. You give us a new perspective on an ordinary thing, a slave drama. And then you, you keep, and then what I love about the, the, the show the most is that every character is so much of a surprise. Like Christopher Maloney's character you think is, is, is good at first, then all of a sudden he turns out to be evil. There are these reversals yeah. that give all these characters dimensions and it's a surprise. It's so well plotted. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, Joe and Misha, our writers and creators, are just brilliant. They really are in being able to dive into the nuances, the complexities of what makes us all tick, what makes us human, you know. And really, in this time period, it's interesting to explore that not everything was black and white. You know, there were some real shades of gray. Not everyone that was good was all good, and not everyone that was bad was all bad. And, you know, as an actor, that's like your dream because – you, you don't get pigeonholed into being the bad guy or being the good guy or woman, you know? Um, and I think we just wanted to be bold and wanted it to be unexpected. Um, and I think, you know, when you do research about the men and women from this time period, you learn how, just how complex they were, just how complex life was, you know? Um, for, for instance, Rosa Lee, you know, they, they were inspired to write Rosalie when they read a letter of a young woman who was debating whether or not she would run. You know, and in 2016, we could sit here and be like, of course you run. But what fascinates no, That's your character in the beginning, too. She is deeply conflicted. She's, um, she's not sure she wants to go. She's not sure she's capable of going. She's not sure she's made of it, you know. And for a young woman in 1857 who's never stepped outside of the plantation, think about that. This is the entire world that she knows. Think about how deep that brainwashing is. You know, she's saturated in believing or being told that this is the best life is ever going to be. And you should never dare to dream. Dreaming could get you killed, first of all. Second of all, you don't have the right to dream. You don't have the right to think you're better than this because there's plenty of people who have it worse than you. Um, and so you just keep your head down and be content because you work in the house. And you should be grateful for having that position. And, you know, so think about how difficult it would be to overcome just the psychological battle of that. Let alone the physical battle of physically running off the plantation and overcoming, you know, all the conditions. The psychological battle was actually the hardest to overcome. Especially when you look at Rosalie's 
decisions compared to her mother. So her mother asserts herself in very, and I love your mother. It's like, she's like my favorite um, character on the show because the choices that she makes are brilliant. On one hand, she says to her children, you know, don't run, don't, don't take gambles, but she takes gambles all the time herself in the house. And um, of course the, uh, uh, the biggest gamble she makes later on, you know, spoiler here, of course, is she ends up killing the plantation owner and uh, risking everything as things, uh, we don't know where, they, where they're left off. She's being put up for sale at the end of the show. But your mother is, in other words, a bold woman like yourself, and you, your character takes inspiration from this, who's made other choices that could have been your choices. Yeah. She's decided to work with the system. She's decided to make the system work for her. Um, and... And although she tells me one thing, her actions betray the very thing she tells me. Yeah. Um, and so I've been able to watch that my entire life and watch how, you know, you can use your, your wits. You can use your smarts. You can use all of these things available to you to try to make life better and try to get your way. But her choice is to stay within the system. My choice, obviously, out of desperation is that the system's no longer going to work for me. The system's going to backfire. And, um, and you know, it's interesting because right before, um, you know, I had decided that I wasn't capable of running. You know, I had made the choice because I felt so weighed down with seeing how, you know, my mistake with the, with the stamp yeah. um, going missing made everyone suffer, you know. Um, and my mom kind of had to get me out of that one. So it just, it just completely defeated any belief in myself. Um, but then when the situation happens with Bill, you see that, you know, Rosalie it has the same survival instincts that Ernestine has, except she's willing to go a few steps further. But how does she go that last step? Uh, what do you think the pivotal moment is that, of course, the big surprise at the end is uh, you get climbing out of that wagon being um, being embraced by Harriet Tubman, or who we assume is a Harriet Tubman type character. Mm -hmm. And you're going back. So how does Rosalie, looking back from the reluctance at the plantation and the escape to the end, okay, I understand how she gradually becomes emboldened to flee, and I understand how she may want to inspire other people to do it. But what gives her that extra kick to say, I can go back? Just looking back over the storyline of the of the season, what do you think were those key moments that made her, or was it any one thing, or was it a cumulative thing? Yeah, I, I don't think it was a, it was one thing. I definitely think it was a cumulative. I think the fact that they've lost so many of the people that they started off, they lost so many of their comrades, so many of the Making Seven have fallen. I think, um, you know, one thing in doing research that I learned is that oftentimes when when a man or a woman would run and survive this crazy um, route to freedom, when they got there, they realized freedom ain't, ain't all that free. There's a price you pay for it. And it's not actually what you thought it was going to be. And I think there's something about learning that she lost her brother. That's just the last, the last thread in realizing how can I – go on living my life up here, knowing that my little brother James and my mother probably are going to face the same, the same um, fate that my older brother Sam faced if I do nothing, if I don't go back, if I don't at least try. And it is, you know, there's that moment when she's talking with, when I'm talking with Noah, where I say, we're, we're not free until we're all free. And that is something that was actually very true for a lot of men and women who gained their freedom but felt they lost everything else and couldn't sleep at night because they knew, wow, you know, how can I live my life in peace knowing that my family, are, they're still down there. Um, so I think it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a few events but there's something about loss for Rosalie, you know, there's something about that, you know, she was determined to make it to freedom for several reasons. Boo was one of them, though. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that Boo lost her mother was a driving factor in trying to get Boo to freedom. And so one of the things that so motivated her along the way 
once she achieves that, she realizes, well, there's this other major loss in my life. And, you know, I think there is that, there's just that spirit of revolution that she has, you know, she's like a warrior and she wasn't always that way, you know, um, which is so fascinating for me in exploring her because that was one of the things we discussed a lot with Misha and Joe um, in just how, you know, having patience with her strength, you know, um, not playing to the end, you know, knowing where she's going, but having patience with it. Where um, is she at the end? Is she in Ohio or is she in Canada? She's in Ohio. Oh, she is. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, some states, uh, I know like Illinois and Indiana, they had um, some of these black code laws that even though they wouldn't allow free blacks in the state at all, there were laws against it. I don't, I think Ohio wasn't that bad, but so she wasn't totally free either in Ohio. Well, well because was, the, there was the fugitive slave law that could yeah, have grabbed her. The slave act um, really made it, you know, impossible for you to live up in the North anyways, because you were constantly under danger. Um, so she would have had to eventually run to Canada, but um, she makes it as far as Elizabeth and John's house. Okay. She, um, you know, uh, she then meets up with William Steele, and um, that's when she makes this, the decision to go back. I mean, she, look, she's lost Noah. She's mm -hmm. lost so many members of her family. Um, it just would be impossible because, you know, by the end, Rosalie has definitely become a leader. You know, there were times when Noah fell and when he was shot that she had to pick up the baton. And, you know, again, it was out of desperation that she kind of had to step into these choices. But why uh, does, does uh, where does a woman find the strength? Harriet Tubman is a good example. She's a real character, of course, that um, you, you would expect all right, a, a, a man would fight those odds and would trudge through those marshes and, and get there. But these women were twice oppressed. They were oppressed by their gender and they were oppressed by the uh, society of slaves. Where does that woman come up with that extraordinary, I mean, far more uh, inspiring strength needed to do this? You know, I think it's survival. We were made that way. And even though we, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> even though we might have had to play a certain role and be docile in the house and keep our head down, it's in us. And um, again, because we are twice oppressed, you know, there's an extra amount of strength that we have that we're born with. Um, someone like a Rosalie, while she's trying to survive in the house, playing a role of being meek and humble, um, you know, that strength is what she was born with. And so given the opportunity, it's going to come out. Um, and I think there's something about being oppressed. When you are oppressed for so long, with any people, when you are oppressed for so long, there's some sort of rage and just strength that comes out in you when you're given just a little bit of freedom. When you can taste just a little bit of freedom, you're like, I, I'm gotta take it, you know? Um, and, you know, I think if you look throughout history, whether it was, you know, in, here, in America or, or abroad, any oppressed people, they find an inner strength inside of them to overcome, you know, and this really is our, our Exodus story. This really is, you know, these men and women who had this amount of courage to do what no one else was doing, um, to stare death in the face and say, you know what, I would rather die than settle for this type of life. Um, you know, I think it's an undertold story and it's why we might watch it and be surprised and be like, what, how could they do that? You know, it's because we haven't seen it yet. Um, but yeah, I mean, for, for us, that was just so important to, was to show that side of the women that they were not just docile. They were not just meek and humble. They had this incredible amount of strength. That, require, that was required of them because they had to survive. Now you've just got picked up for season two. There uh, is a plan, of course, for uh, five seasons total if the show does that, um, uh, goes that far and it seems to be um, now well on its way. I can't imagine anything stopping it. It's becoming so, um, it's gathering more and more strength and fans as it goes. Where would 
do you have any idea where it's going? I mean, there's some things you can't tell us at this point, but are you more and more, are you more or less surprised when you get a script? <laughs> or, do you, or do they, do Joe and Misha say, all right, here's where we're planning Rosalie to go in two years from now, three years from now? You know, they've, they've definitely given me hints. I mean, I think they, they, um, their approach with, with me is a, you know, they definitely like to keep things secretive as, you know, creators like to do from their actors, but they, they want to keep their options open too. Yeah. That's why. yeah. Um, I mean, we definitely can tell just from the way uh, season one ended with episode 10 that yes, I'm going back and yes, I will be mentored by Harriet Tubman. Um, but to that extent, I mean, they don't really tell me much. <laughs> okay, that's cool. That's it. So, what, what you can tell us is give us some stories about shooting the the series this past year. We always love to hear the behind the scenes stories. Was it really uh, a nightmare sw you know, trudging through those swamps? <laughs> I mean, did you have to fend off any alligators, rainstorms? Oh my goodness, all of the above. You know, um, it added a level of authenticity to our characters. But when you see us in a swamp, we're really in a swamp. When Noah and Rosalie are running, that's out of journey, <laughs> you know, really <laughs> right. trudging through that green, disgusting water. And you get out and there's spiders crawling on you. And, you know, Misha kept yelling. It was like a, a common thing. Before each take, it was just, throw more dirt on her. Let's go. You know, <laughs> <laughs> there was a time where we were running. And, you know, between having, I counted one day. I had 27 mosquito bites just on one leg. And, you know, you know, I have pictures of my leg just caked in dirt because we just were running in this swampy dirt all day long. And, you know, it was just real, real challenging conditions. Shooting in Baton Rouge in the elements, um, you just gain this level of appreciation for what our people actually did. You know, I can go home and take a shower afterwards and try to put on some bug ointment. Um, but they didn't have that, man, you know, and that level of strength is just really humbling. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of the stunts, we had stunt men and women, but a lot of the stunts we wanted to do, so we would let them do it. And the producers would freak out and be like, you're not jumping off that boat. Right, there are water mo moccasins in that water there, and alligators if you're in the Baton Rouge area, no, right? seriously. Um, we had a snake wrangler who was constantly, you know, uh, catching snakes. And, you know, for instance, the scene where Maloney and I are, are we, he, we dive off the boat, he pushes me off the boat, and then we're fighting in the water. That really was us. Um, and it's a little ego. Oh, <laughs> know, of as, course, but... You know, as actors, you're like, I could do that. Let me do that. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, you know, it, it was really tough. We had a lot of rain delays. Um, we were shooting. Sometimes it was 110 degrees outside. Um, and most of the scenes, you know, were shot outside. Um, we shot on real plantations. We shot in Batchery, Louisiana. Um, you know, there's something, there's something so humbling when you set on, when you set on the grounds, you step on the grounds of a real plant, plantation. I mean, you can't even describe it. You can feel the spirit in the air, you can feel just the level of pain that those grounds have seen. You know, you just look up at these trees that have been there for centuries and you're just like, my goodness, what strange fruit has just hung from those trees? And, um, you know, it, it definitely was sacred to shoot there for us. Um, we shot at the LSU uh, Rural Life Museum, which no one had been allowed to shoot at before, um, which were real slave quarters, real slave shacks. Um, and it, it's just, you know, it really sets in you, you know, like the, the, the gravity of it really weighs on you when you are there. Uh, how long was like a typical shoot day, like eight hours, 10 hours more? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I have no idea. Eight hours, man. No, I mean, we were averaging like 15, 16 hour days. Yeah. Yeah, we were maxing out, sometimes more, rarely less. Um, and how many we, weeks did the whole season take to shoot? We started in April and ended um, at the 
end of August, like four and a half months. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And we were, you know, shooting two episodes at the same time. Um, and, you know, I think because of that, we, came, we became a very close family. Um, because it was kind of like, we are all we have. You know? <laughs> well, it was worth it. You, you come up with a show that really matters and it's got everybody's attention. And uh, uh, I can't tell you how many times I hear in Hollywood here that they'll say, oh, they've made roots this year for the Emmy season. I wonder how that's going to do in the, in the, um, in the Emmys in terms of slave dramas. And inevitably someone will go, yeah, but it, have you seen that show Underground? <laughs> oh my <laughs> God, have you seen that? It's amazing. And even among my editors on staff, there were five of us here, uh, as we divvy up the workload and say, all right, will you watch these shows and you cover these things? Every single one of us have watched Underground and it's all on everybody's top list. And it because wow. we've talked about it so much among ourselves and have become so emotionally invested in it and, and appreciative of the artistry of this show wow. that um, is, is so well crafted on so many levels. Wow, thank you. I don't take that lightly. That means so much. I really, really appreciate that. Yeah. Well, uh, you deserve all the, all the good things coming your way. <laughs> and go out there with you and Harriet and kick some slave owners' butts next season. Yeah, no, we're going to kick some ass. It's, a, it's about to go down season two. Okay, and take some Emmy voters with you. All right, thanks a yeah. lot, Journey. <laughs> good luck at the Emmys. Thank you.